Hey, this is Science with Chris, and today I'm going to be talking about par echovirus. There was a case that I recently saw in pediatric ID, and I kind of wanted to bring light about kind of this rare new virus. So the case presentation, like hypothetical case, so we have a previously well 29-day-of-life female, twin birth at full term, presenting to us with 103 rectal fever, lethargy for the past two days, uh, kind of poor PO intake, and during the hospital admission where she was symptomatically being treated, she developed seizure-like activity in both arms. Uh, kind of some backstory regarding social history. Brother, three years old, also presented with viral URI symptoms one week ago. So some background about par echovirus, which is what our hypothetical patient had. So it's from the family of the coronaviridae, which is a naked, single, positive, single-stranded RNA virus which was first reported in 1961 as previously echovirus 22 and 23, but due to decreased protein homology sub-30%, they got their new par echovirus subclass. So there's two prevailing clinical subtypes that we're mainly focusing on, which is par echovirus 1 and 3. And 1 has more of this GI URI symptoms, and uh, the th type 3 is more associated with this like CNS effects, seizures, uh, meningitis issues. So for Parcovirus 3, the first reported case was in 2014, and it was of a one-year-old female Japanese who, Japanese female, who presented with fever and diarrhea and ended up developing transient paralysis. And it is relatively recent, but uh, a good question to ask yourself is like how many cases of meningitis secondary to Parecho were reported in 2014 within the U.S. Really? Yeah. So it was only 20 cases from what I've been able to find. So that's pretty low. And I'm going to get into kind of why that is not just exclusively due to rarity, but we're going to get into a little bit of reason more why. Well, the clinical presentations. So you're going to get like your typical palmar plantar erythematous rash. Possibly you might get a sepsis like picture with our patients as well. Um, but there's also the severe association where you're going to have this encephalitis, meningitis, or meningocephalitis, um, as well as possible transient paralysis, which we noted in the one-year-old Japanese female. And the picture below kind of shows when you have inflammation of certain areas of the brain, kind of what's affected. So how are you going to differentiate the seizures caused by echovirus from parechovirus? You can yeah, so you definitely cannot differentiate the seizures. So if they present with like tonic-clonic or some type of like focal seizure, this is not unique to a certain viral etiology. So you have to know that. And even temporally, they're both the same. So how does the pathophysiology work? And this is kind of where science is at the fringe as of current. But it isn't completely understood, but there is a believed mechanism where cytokines are used from this virus and from the inflammation that the virus causes to loosen the blood-brain barrier, allowing the entry of this virus. It is a uh, non-envelope, so it uses kind of its receptors on the surface to bind in and transport through. And we can notice this from the A diagram where we're looking at the virus right here entering in. We see like polio virus and body virus kind of going through the same mechanism. Generally, echovirus research has been shown that it can infect neural progenitor cells through the suspected cytokine mechanism, and though the progenitor cells can be infected, their migration patterns are not impeded. That being said, though, they do lose their ability to proliferate inside the CNS. In order to diagnose par echovirus, uh, we can use some imaging modalities. Two of them are MRI and cranial ultrasound. Research has shown that ultrasound is inadequately sensitive, so we prefer an MRI where we're going to be looking at our white matter abnormalities. And on the top right of the screen, we can kind of see where these white lesions are located. And this was in a uh, patient with one day history of parcovirus infection. So how do we further actually diagnose that this is parechovirus and not just another virus causing um, these like seizure-like activities? And so the gold standard right here is RT-PCR. And 
Going back to why there are so few cases reported for parvovirus-associated meningitis is partly due to the fact that the typical primers used actually for HPV were not founded in two, until 2006. So it's possible that while the patient did have a parvovirus infection, they didn't use a proper ME panel when they were actually locating what the virus is going to be. The two other subtypes are viral isolation and serology. Serology, just straight up, we don't use it anymore. Poor standardization and cross-reactivity kind of make it obsolete, where viral isolation is interesting for us from a research perspective because it allows us to type the viruses more specifically between one and three. And I think there's actually 16 types of HPEV currently uh, known. So how do we treat uh, a parvovirus patient. So yeah, so patient comes in, we did the RT-PCR, we had the MRI confirmed, but treatment really doesn't change, with, however, though. So it's still mostly supportive. We're giving our fluids for tachycardia or the poor perfusion. We can give IVIGs. Now, there are mixed reports on this, and this is kind of what I wanted to research more, but there's actually very little out there. So it's mixed reports about neonates, but individual case reports do note that there are positive effects. If my child were to come in, uh, I would for, and my child had this, I would for sure want to be giving IVIG. And kind of what I've been looking at is the um, intracellular and extracellular levels of the RNA for a parvovirus actually decrease if you're giving IVIG. And the dosing that I've been researching about is 700, 750 mg per keg. But that, at that dose, it didn't show clinical benefits or reduction in viremia in the 16 EV patients. So for EV and parvovirus, there's like some variability. So we're still looking at like proper dosaging for parvo. The last two things are like these antivirals right here. This is kind of on up to date as well, but these antivirals are only used in very hyper select cases. Like if your if your patient has brutins or something like this, and they're affected with polio, so we're not going to really go into those as treatments. But really, it's IVIG and supportive care. The outcomes are also variable, and that's also something else I wanted to talk about. So there are two main papers that they ended up showing, and one of them was a Britain et al., and the last one was a Verboon et al. And the Britain was 2016, so it's pretty recent, and that was the only paper that actually was able to show short term effects. And they were able to show that, and if you look at the screen right here, the, the fraction that I have is out of the people that were available, the number before it is how many presented with the symptoms. So none are minor short-term uh, neurological effects was noted in six out of nine, where moderate was only three out of nine. When we look at long terms, we're able to look at Verboon and Britain. And what they were able to show is that there is an increase of risk for cerebral palsy where they were noted at two out of eight in the Britain paper. And this is post 12 months and in the Verboon paper, one out of 10. And these are both females. So it's kind of interesting to note that there's like a female. Um, it is more likely that this is going to be occurring in a female than a male. And additionally, there's also twin girl association as well, which is something interesting that we need to kind of research as a whole. But I mean, here's some, these are the other facts as well. And I'm going to be linking the papers below in the video so you can look at them yourselves if you would like. But both papers, by and large, do agree that MRI changes are what you're going to be using to determine the severity. And this will only be available if you had a trained eye or if you've seen enough parvovirus infection to be like, wow, like those white lesions one day post confirmed diagnosis are actually serious. But they do agree that MRI changes are the more severe the MRI change, the more likely they're going to have severe neurological impairments. So how do we prevent this? This is still simple hygiene. The right, right side of the screen, we have simple hand-washing technique because this is a fecal-oral transmission virus like most positive single-strand RNAs. And the last thing is that there was a pregnant-associated case where a patient in Japan 2017 was infected with parvovirus 3, did fully recover, and I think we're still waiting to see about the long-term neurological effects for the infant. Here my work cited, we had the two papers by Verboon et al. in Britain at the top, and then some other papers that I looked at later on. Hope this helped. Thanks.